something extraordinary is happening on planet Earth. Human beings are living longer than ever before. From Japan to Africa, from Europe to South America, more people than ever before are living into their 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond in what many scientists believe to be the most radical change since human civilization began. The world's population is changing more rapidly than at any other time in our history. According to the UN, the number of older people trebled between 1950 and 2000 and will treble again over the next 40 years. In just a few short decades, one third of the developed world's population will be over 60. Imagine what that will look like. Here in Ireland, the same incredible transformation is underway. Half of all baby girls born this year will live to be over 100. Some scientists believe that this is just the beginning, that in the not too distant future, we will be able to halt aging entirely. There should be no limit on how long people can live. Human technology has taken the reins of evolution, so to speak. It's tremendously exciting in the field of genetics because you can make a mouse that lives 50% longer, and at that age, it doesn't look like it's an old mouse. It looks like a young mouse. In Ireland, scientists, doctors, and sociologists are trying to understand the processes affecting our age and what implications they will have for our future. Never before in the history of mankind have we a society where so many people have the privilege of living into old age. It's either what they call a burden or a bounty, and we're at a stage now where, to a large degree, we can influence which outcomes we have. Having a significant number of older people will have a huge impact on the way society works, and it'll force us to ask a number of fundamental questions. Do we want to live longer? Can we afford our pension and healthcare system? What will the third age mean for you and for me? Radical changes will be necessary, but if we plan and manage this correctly, our later years could be our best years. I swim because I love it and physically it's good, emotionally it's good, spiritually it's good everywhere. In myself and my friend, during the season we try and get in at least one swim a day and sometimes two. And to come down and the sea is kind of pink with the sun and to get into that water, it's just, it's a very good, energetic, enervating feeling of achievement. Words like old and young don't have a huge meaning for me except that feeling of course that I know objectively at my age, I'm considered old, and I'm not quite as spry as I was. But in terms of my heart, and my feelings, and my joys, and my wishes, and my ambitions, I'm ageless, I think. So we're off the doubling in the green, in the green. With a helmet glistening in the sun. Look around you. Where the clay Everywhere you will see signs that people are living longer and, for the most part, more productive lives than our ancestors could ever have hoped for. I'm 83. I'm 78. I'm 84. I'm 72. I'm 92. So what's going on? Back in 1840, the poorer classes could expect to live to 38 on average. Anything beyond that was considered a highly unusual achievement. Indeed, in those days, there were so few older people around that society, quite naturally, held them in high esteem, venerating them for their wisdom and experience. Then, from about the 1830s, across Europe and America, something very odd began to happen. In the 1850s, the infant mortality and the childhood mortality was, was very, very high quite a high percentage of children under the age of 10 died, something like 50% or whatever, so that most parents had large families to compensate for this. And it was part of life at that time that people died when they were very young. What happened then was that the conditions that people were living under began to improve. 
engineering got better, waterworks got better, housing got better, food got better, which was a very, very important aspect of it. And more people began to survive childhood. And this, of course, was a major achievement for mankind. demographic shift can be clearly seen in a visit to a graveyard. Take a look at the headstones. These ones are from the early 1800s. Look at the ages people were dying at. A six-year-old there, a 16-year-old here, a couple of people in their 20s over there. Absolutely normal for the times. Now look what happens from the 1840s onwards. Average life expectancy begins to rise and continues to do so at a remarkably consistent rate. Today in Ireland, women can expect to live to 81 years and men to 76. What is most interesting is that scientists believe the increase will continue at the same rate. By 2040, we can expect to live to 104. Who knows what we might be looking at in the future? So what does this mean for you at home? If you were born in the 1940s, you can expect on average to live to about 70 years of age. If you were born in the 1960s, you should be hoping to hit 75, all things being equal. And if you were born in the 1980s, you should be looking for at least 80 years of life. If you've just been born now, then you should be planning to live to 90, 100 or more. Clearly something incredible is happening. We are living longer than at any other time in human history. The big question is why? In most Western countries, better diet, education, increasing wealth, along with the improved availability and standards of healthcare, have all contributed to how long we live. In the current economic climate, it may seem hard to credit, but on the whole, our lives are better than those of our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Modern life is easier. It's less stressful and more fulfilling. We've better food, better hygiene, and more time to relax than we ever had before. This is not just a Western phenomenon. A similar growth in the ratio of older to younger people is being observed across the developing world. In fact, it's happening even faster there, as better medical care, education, water systems and food chains are put in place, allowing many to benefit from improved quality of life within a single generation. These changes in lifespan will present a major challenge to the infrastructure of countries across the planet. It's very important when talking about life expectancy to remember that when we say people had a life expectancy of 50 in the past, it meant that the average age of death was 50. People were living to 70 and 100 then as well. The difference is going to be that we're going to have an entire cohort, all of whom will be 70 and 80 years of age and all at the same time. That's potentially very, very exciting. What is even more fascinating is that many experts believe that advances in science and technology will see humans living longer than anything predicted before. I think genetics is providing more and more answers all the time to questions that have occupied philosophers for millennia. You know, there's a, a kind of a question of how far into science fiction you, you go in making these kinds of predictions. I don't see any theoretical reason why you couldn't halt aging in its tracks. It is possible that some of us living today might achieve what humans have longed for since time began, immortality. Before we look at how ageing might be halted altogether, let's first consider some ways in which we can have a direct impact on the length of our lives. After decades of research, scientists have confirmed six critical factors which dramatically alter the quality and longevity of life. And most of the things that we know contribute to living longer can be found in a place like this. Good balanced diet, consistent exercise, friends, good friends, laughter, 
sex and happiness. Happy people live longer. The first step to happy, healthy, longer life is exercise. Mick Gillick is 84. I wouldn't see myself all the time. It's a great thing when someone says to me, what age are you making? I'd say 85 or not. No one ever says I am. They don't agree with me. <laughs> so like, you get a great kick out of that. But no way would I be past it. Because like, I'm popular with the women too. <laughs> that Mick does not feel past it has probably got a lot to do with the amount of exercise he takes. Staying active and maintaining fitness have been clinically proven to be good not only for the body and muscles, but also for our minds, improving our cognitive skills and memory. Exercise is one of the key factors in promoting healthy ageing. You don't have to spend hours in the gym. A brisk walk of 10 minutes three times a week has been shown to produce very positive effects. I like this one. It's good for your knees. We come over, we shake a leg over here, I'm telling you. This keeps us alive. It increases your self-esteem, your feeling of well-being, and your, your sense of happiness, and these are all very positive things. Well, I didn't have mine. <laughs> food is important to me. I live on my own now, so I'm cooking for myself, choosing food and making it look nice on the plate and the whole colour combination and all that is very important. The market in Dunleary is, is brilliant. I am healthy enough in terms of my food choices. I decided I wouldn't go on a diet, but what I did is I bought a smaller plate and I filled the centre of the plate and the idea is that you have more fruit, more vegetables and then you have meat, you know. So I would have hopefully one or two or three vegetables per meal and then a smaller amount of meat or, meat or rice or pasta. And that's good and I think you can get into the habit of eating too much and equally you can get into the habit of eating, of eating less. Anne Dempsey's decision to eat a little less than she might normally be inclined to is having a very positive impact on her health. Humans who do the opposite, who eat more than they need, find that overeating brings on severe chronic illnesses that can drastically shorten our lives, including heart disease, high blood pressure and diabetes. It's being estimated that about 60% of health problems in old age can be traced back to poor diet. It can produce cardiac side effects, weak muscles, weak bones. Just as important as how much we eat are the food choices we make. One simple rule is that the darker the fruit and vegetables, the better. Plums, blueberries, broccoli, cabbage are all high in antioxidants, which directly affect our cells' ability to replicate themselves. My heart in the Black Hills, the Black Hills of Dakota. People who maintain good relationships with others are 50% less likely to die young. And according to new evidence, social isolation can be even more harmful to your health than smoking. Spending time with good friends has been shown to decrease the inflammations which cause cancer, heart disease, stroke and dementia. The extent to which you maintain relationship with friends is vitally important to your, your health and your well-being. And living a life with purpose, with meaning, uh, having lots of have-to-dos in a day is very important. The Third Age Foundation in Summerhill, County Meath, is one of many new establishments where older people come together to enjoy their later years. Well, the Third Age it does, it means a lot for me. Because first of all, when my wife died, which would have been 15 years ago, I got in touch with Summer Hill. So I won't say it filled a void, but it did fill in a lot of the missing pieces, if you like. This more or less opened my eyes to a new life. One of the big problems for, for some older people is the l tremendous loneliness when they lose their husband or their wives and that huge hole that's left in their lives. And it's so difficult for people to find a substitute. One of the key things
things is to make it easy for, for older people to stay socially engaged, that they are there absolutely in the centre of their communities, that they feel that there are things they want to go to, people they want to meet, things they want to achieve. It's an absolutely crucial part of well-being. is hugely important for health. There is good evidence that it improves our immune response, which is important in preventing infections, arthritis, cancers and heart disease. In fact, hospitals in America have introduced clowns to the wards, and their presence has been shown to improve the speed at which patients recover. The same research has concluded that having a laugh can actually prevent chronic diseases like dementia and reduce the amount of time older people stay in hospital even after major surgery. For those of us approaching later life, this has to be good news, as is the news that doing something everyone enjoys can bring additional benefits. So you think sex is the preserve of the young? Wrong. A recent study has shown that a third of older couples have sexual activity at least once a week, and a third of those engage in oral sex. Of course, this is great news of itself, but it also helps to slow the aging process. And if the reward is a few more years on this planet, surely it's worth the extra effort. I walked in the airport, Dublin airport. I used to do deliveries from there. Karma walked in the airport and that's just how we met. I knew right away we liked each other. Both of us are married twice. Like, you don't, you don't forget the people. I'm 73 and Tony's 76. Yeah. So I still feel young and you know, Just when I look in the mirror, I say, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what love really means, it's just that we, we want to be together. And sometimes people remark like that, how we're always together, that we don't get fed up at times with each other, but we don't. Yeah. We go everywhere together and we yeah. do everything together. I do all the washing up. There's no, that does not done together. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a sex life, and, yeah. but um, nicely spaced time. <laughs> 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 it wouldn't be as often as yeah. if I was when we were younger, but it's still there. It brings us closer together, and we'd, we'd have a good uh, laugh now and again, and close yeah. partnership. You know? yeah. Yeah. We have evidence that older people who continue to have an active sex life have a much better chance of remaining physically and psychologically healthy. Because part of, of being sexually active uh, is feeling young. And the evidence is really good. You know, if you feel young, it actually has real effects on your body. The sixth step to a longer life is choice having the power to choose to live your life in a way that interests you. Too often when we hit our 60s, we are forced to take a step back, to limit our horizons, to stop participating in society. Why should we have to stop working at a particular age or stop having sex or hang up the car keys? What's becoming clear to us in the scientific community is that having choice is critical for a successful and healthy later life. The choice to live the way we want, where we want, to enjoy our friends, to carry on working and to do what stimulates us. Who says life should end at 65? So, 
If we look after our diet, exercise and enjoy ourselves, we can add many happy years to our lives. When combined with better living standards and advances in medicine, these factors will see human lifespans escalate rapidly in coming decades, leading many scientists to believe that the first person to live to be 150 has already been born. But that may only be the start of it. Imagine for a moment that there was no such thing as old age, that we could live forever. Even as we speak, hundreds of laboratories around the world are researching this very question. Understanding the cause of aging will enable us to manipulate cells so that we can stop them from aging and from dying. Scientists are literally this far from finding the mythical elixir of eternal life. Aging is a biological phenomenon that causes people to get sick. So, by definition, more or less, it is, in theory, a legitimate target for medical intervention. The real question then is, can we actually develop medicine in the foreseeable future that will treat aging just as effectively as we can currently treat infectious diseases, for example? And I think, yes, I think there's a very good chance that we will be able to do that in the next few decades. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is a visionary working at the front line of genetics. He and the Sense Foundation he runs are working to make advances in genetic science which will substantially increase the human lifespan. You can think of it as simply preventative geriatrics. Some of the fixes will involve gene therapy. They will involve actually using viruses typically to manipulate the genomic and genetic composition of our cells. Some of them will involve stem cell therapy, putting new cells into the body that have been conditioned in the laboratory so as to proliferate and differentiate into the types of cell that are not being automatically replaced by the division of stem cells that are in the body already. There may also be more traditional types of medicine involved, things like vaccines and regular pharmaceutical drugs. And there may also be surgery involved. We may, in some cases, want to replace whole organs with organs created using tissue engineering, for example. Well, so what this means in terms of how long people will actually live, and I want to emphasize that I don't work on longevity. I work on keeping people healthy, and the longevity benefits are simply a side benefit. But the consequences in terms of longevity will be de determined by what we achieve with regard to causes of death that don't have to do with aging. So at the moment, if we calculate how long people would live if they maintained the same risk of death each year that they have at the age of, let's say, 25, then we come out with numbers around 1,000 years as the average lifespan. And of course, some people would live a lot longer than that, and some people less long. In Trinity College, Dublin, geneticists are also working to understand how genes impact on ageing. One approach being followed is research into why different organisms begin to die at particular points in their lives. The reason that we age, the reason that, that uh, organisms age, is simply really that, that their cells undergo a process of wear and tear. Their cells are, are just biochemical machines, really, and, and like other machines, their, their components can break down over time. And um, it turns out that there are genes whose job it is to try and prevent that. Looking at the lifespans of specific animals can be very revealing. The one thing that all living creatures have in common is death. But what's interesting is it strikes at different times dependent on the species. The mouse dies at three, the giraffe at 40, the dog at 18, Humans manage about 80, while Darwin's turtle can live to 150. And then there's the freshwater hydra. Now, as far as we know, this lives forever. If we could find out what makes it immortal and apply that to humans, we might be able to end aging completely. One cause that geneticists have discovered to influence lifespan is food. When you decrease the nutrients available to an organism, it lives longer. Recent research has shown that if a mouse reduces its dietary intake by a third from birth, it will extend its lifespan by 30%. Even when the same reduction in food intake is introduced halfway through the mouse's life, 
It still has a massive impact. The mouse will live 20% longer. While we don't definitively know if this applies to humans, there is emerging evidence that a significant dietary restriction could extend our lifespan by five years. One of the first clues was this a fact that what's called caloric restriction or dietary restriction can increase lifespan. And it does it across a whole, whole range of species, from mammals to insects and worms, even yeast, actually, if you feed them less. Um, they, will, they will live a lot longer. And so we now know that actually one of the most robust ways you can get an organism to age more slowly is simply to restrict the amount of nutrients that it gets. Geneticists now realize that when a cell thinks food is scarce, it activates genes that shift the cell's focus away from growth and into preservation. This effectively slows the aging process. Pharmaceutical companies are designing drugs that will fool cells into thinking that nutrients are scarce. Soon, living longer may involve little more than popping a pill. The hope is that, that by administering these kinds of drugs, you may see really significant increases in human lifespan. And the hope would be that actually by, by blocking the cellular aging process itself, in one fell swoop, you actually would stop many age-related diseases. So, so that you would have people you know, who are not developing heart disease, they're not developing cancers, they're not developing diabetes uh, and any of the other um, age-related diseases if in this one administration you, you block um, aging itself. As advances in genetic science continue to be made, we may soon be able to manipulate organs and cells, making them renew themselves instead of aging. The future may bring some very surprising results with some treatments making it impossible to tell a person's age. The little girl next door could be a lot older than you think. The human race is going through a radical transformation. People are living longer and fuller lives. And pretty soon, Genetic treatments may allow us to live even longer than could ever have been previously imagined. All of this will have major implications for how we work, when we retire, and how we manage healthcare. What if we crack the cause of aging and can modify the aging process so that we're all living significantly longer? Think of the demographic change. The majority of people living will be over the age of 60. This will require a fundamental change in the structure of our society. The question is, are we ready for this? In his early 70s, Michael represents the average pension. In the early years of the 20th century, there would have been 22 people of working age paying taxes towards Michael's state pension, his health care costs, and any other social services he might expect. That was then. If we fast forward to the present day, we find that this ratio has changed dramatically. Today, there are only six people of working age paying taxes to support all of Michael's needs. In the next few decades, as more and more people live longer, the ratio will drop to two to one. Of course, this is not sustainable. The time has come to take a whole fresh look at pensions, retirement, and at the way we work. The way society currently functions, most of us begin our careers in our mid-twenties and continue up to 65, when we expect to retire with a good pension. But with an exponentially expanding older society, public pensions will simply be unaffordable. When state pensions were first introduced on a universal basis, few people were expected to live to retirement age. Today, as we've seen, most people can expect to live well beyond 65. 65 was picked as a parameter for aging by Bismarck back in the, in the 19th century when he introduced pensions in Germany because he realized that very few people would live to be 65 so he wouldn't have to pay many pensions. And we become stuck with this concept of retiring at 65 and that it, for somehow or other life changes dramatically in some way. This should not be the case. 
One of the reasons that states throughout the world are arguing that pension ages have to rise is as people are living longer and longer, they're spending a bigger proportion of their lives uh, in retirement. And of course, the, uh, the cost of that per individual increases. If you go back to about 2005, state spending on old age social welfare pensions amounted to about 3% of gross national product. Now we estimated by 2050 that percentage will be over 9%, a very, very significant increase in the burden, the social welfare burden. So there's ultimately a choice here for society. Do you want to raise taxes and uh, for the state to carry on paying old age pensions? Or do you increasingly want to say to people, no, the, the state will look after you to a certain degree, but after a certain point you're on your own? <laughs> Think of the value that older people can bring to the workforce. Think of the sheer wealth of knowledge they have accumulated across a lifetime. As we get older, our speed and reaction capabilities decrease, but there is a lot to be said for the expression, wise old owl. My name is Patrick Casserly. I was 78 on the 7th of March of this year. I can't see myself as old. I still think I can do the things I did 25 years ago, and I tried to do the things I did 25 years ago. That's what keeps you going. So in actual fact, I'm not retired. I have no, I have no intention to retire, actually. No. I was employed here in 2003 as a part-time worker. B&Q suit me fine in that respect, the four hours a day. 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, that suits me fine. We have an S6P2. B&Q are blazing a trail. One quarter of their employees are over 50. In the UK, their oldest worker is 95. You're well stopped up there, isn't you? Yeah. Older workers are regarded as highly reliable. They're very loyal. They have a tremendous amount of experience. For example, uh, managerial expertise does not diminish with age. And also, older people have a, a very good uh, effect on, on the younger workforce. They're a kind of a stabilising influence. I get a great sense of enjoyment out of work. I still feel physically fit and physically able to continue on as I am. If somebody come along and said to me, you're finishing tomorrow, I'd probably dispute it because I feel physically fit and all ready to go. That Paddy is still working happily and productively at the age of 78 should not be surprising. really care for music, do you? With the ringing of a bell in the back of my mind. We're not surprised to see iconic figures in the fields of arts and media working long after people in other areas have retired. Why should this not be the case in the fields of education, social services, law, business management, where older people could be an incredible asset? Eddie Brennan gives it inside now to Richie Power and Richie Power. The goalkeeper is out. He has it though. Other countries around the world have already begun to change their approach. In Japan, which faces a similar situation to Ireland, 5% of over 90s are still at work. And in Holland, 65% of grandmothers and 60% of grandfathers provide childcare. In doing so, they are making an enormous contribution to the economy and to society as a whole. With living into our 90s and 100s set to become the norm, we will have to radically and urgently rethink the way we live. Our typical sort of model of work is that you get sort of promoted and promoted and promoted, you acquire more and more responsibility, and then in a sense you go out at the top. It's unusual enough for people to step down, but a lot of the research in the area would say that that's exactly what people want to do. And I think it's an opportunity to rethink working life. We don't want necessarily to hurtle through life in a very intensive 40-year working period. We could redesign it so that people have time out at a time when they're having children, and then at the same time to be able to work much, much later, into later years, but at a different pace. The next few decades will see radical change in the areas of retirement and pensions but they will pale in comparison to the changes we will see in what is one of the most complex and expensive sectors in society, health care. <laughs> With 
With over 60s set to account for a third of the population by 2050, the provision of medical care is going to require a major overhaul. As senior gerontologist in St. James's Hospital in Dublin, Professor Davis Coakley understands the problem well. One of the biggest challenges is health in old age. There are several significant problems old people can develop, such as uh, respiratory problems, cardiac problems, strokes, osteoarthritis, neurological problems such as Parkinson's, endocrine problems which can often be missed. Chronic disease will produce more and more disability as people get older and the state would have to spend far more than it is spending at the moment on long-term care either in institutions or in the community. This is likely to go up significantly if we don't take a more sensible attitude to ageing. In the world as a whole, about 80% of healthcare costs are in chronic disease management. And currently, most of that care for people suffering chronic disease are managed in acute settings, which are hospitals. And there simply isn't going to be enough hospitals or doctors or nurses to take care of them in the current model. The United States is actually a very interesting example in this area. They don't have a particularly old population, uh, but they do spend a massive proportion of uh, their gross national product on health. And really what that points to is that health spending very, very often is much more related to the nature of the system that you organise. And, you know, inflation in the healthcare system could be much more to do with how you organise insurance and the general uh, organisation of the system. We're not necessarily in deep trouble. And again, I think with a degree of creativity, we can probably avoid some of the, the, the more extreme scenarios that are sometimes presented on the health side. At 114 years old, Anne-Eugénie Blanchard is currently the oldest living person on Earth. For the past 30 years, more than a quarter of her life, Anne-Eugénie has been living in a nursing home. I'm sure she's comfortable, but it's probably not what she had in mind. Few of us would choose to spend our last few years in a nursing home, nor would we choose to die in hospital if we could avoid it, or spend hours in an emergency department when we're sick. By using the advances in science and technology, there is a solution. We can provide a healthcare service that works for all. Hi, Brendan. How are you? I'm Trisha. Welcome Hi, to Tilda. You can go this way with me. The key to the new approach is to keep people out of the hospital system for as long as possible. Instead, focusing on prevention and early detection. It's cheaper and it makes people more comfortable. You all right? Okay. Yep. In Ireland, the medical, scientific and technology sectors are working to turn the country into a global innovation hub of excellence in health technologies and ageing. Brendan, I'm just going to take a picture of your eye. There, great. By conducting in-depth tests on thousands of people, we're building up a clear picture of how people age and also learning how we can spot the onset of chronic disease long before it becomes a problem. The current paradigm is reactive. The new paradigm is moving to prevention. And in some countries where they have put in preventative models, it actually shown that they decrease the cost of the healthcare system significantly. Sweden's one of those. And they can compare county to county where they're still in a reactive model versus preventative model and show the benefits both in reduced costs as well as people being better, you know, just healthier. This state-of-the-art housing complex in Dundalk is a first tentative move towards a preventative approach in Ireland. As well as being fitted out with useful gadgets and equipment, the house has been embedded with sensor technology that tracks Sean's movements throughout the day. Should he change from his normal behaviour, the central monitoring system will alert the medical professionals that Sean may require attention. Sean is also testing out a personal health monitoring system. Technology of this kind offers a glimpse of the future of healthcare. Put the blood pressure 
pressure cuff on your arm as shown. The Intel Health Guide, I feel like there's two parts to it. There's a device that is placed in the older person's home, um, but that then is connected to what we call the healthcare management suite. Have you noticed swelling in your feet, ankles or legs? That essentially allows the care team to manage the specific care that that person needs. I've had a look at the information you've sent through and I see you've got a swelling in your legs. And my right leg especially, but with a sore around the ankle area, yeah. Would you like a nurse to pop in and see you? Yeah, that's, that, that would be nice. I wouldn't mind that, yeah. A lot of what will be possible is going to be dependent on there being within the community these integrated primary care practices, which involves a range of expertise across the different disciplines of the, the doctor, the nurse, the occupational therapist, the physiotherapist, but it's also a range of support facilities like basic diagnostics. Hello, Sean. It's Leona, the public health nurse. I'm just calling to see how you are. As technologies advance and we come to understand ageing better, the aim is to provide a more tailor-made medical service that is tuned to the actual needs of each individual person and focused on the community and on the home. OK, Jim, you'd like to go now? In one of the most in-depth joint ventures between academia and technology companies in the world, groundbreaking clinical studies in Ireland are informing the development of new technologies which aim to dramatically change the way healthcare is provided. One exciting experiment is the shimmer sensor. It monitors how people walk, and scientists hope it will act as an early detection system. In the future, devices which are the size of this will be this size. We'll be able to implant them in the body, and as we go about our daily lives, they will constantly gather information and transmit that information to healthcare professionals. This will completely revolutionize the way we deliver healthcare. With a tiny chip implanted in his body, Sean can get on with his life. If a problem arises, the chip will trigger an immediate response from the emergency response units. I think certainly when we develop sufficiently sophisticated monitoring and diagnosis done by things that are, for example, implanted in the body or else are in the home, then it will certainly be possible to identify when someone is at risk of some real medical emergency before it happens and thereby come and effectively take you off to get preventative treatment before you even know consciously that you're ill. Whether you need a hip operation or a triple bypass or some groundbreaking genetic treatment, you could be sped off to the local clinic to be operated on by a robot. This technology, which is already available at the Galway Clinic, allows surgeons to operate on the patient remotely from a connected centre of excellence anywhere in the world. Robotic theatres like this will become more prevalent, allowing for a far more effective and efficient delivery of primary health care. I think today's telecare and telehealth systems are, are just the beginning. They're kind of like the first foray into this new space. I think it'll be a lot more sophisticated. I think we will have healthcare on, on whatever kind of portable devices that we carry, whether it's a PDA or a cell phone. I think we will be wearing some kind of sensors, uh, whether it's just on the body or in the body. I think we'll just get so used to an information flow going over and back between us and whoever our healthcare team is. I think there's endless possibilities in terms of not just health management, also wellness and staying well so that you prevent disease. When we consider the state of the Irish Health Service, Many might think that radical changes like these are way beyond the scope of its capacity. And yet, as increasing numbers of people achieve longer and longer lifespans, there will be no alternative but to provide the new technologies and genetic therapies that are being developed. The economic arithmetic is totally uncontrovertible. Today, we have a situation where the amount of money that's spent on the average person's medical care in the last year of their life is actually more than what's spent on their medical care throughout the whole of the rest of their life added together. And that's irrespective of how old they are when they die. Now, all that money is going to be saved because people aren't going to get into the state of having Alzheimer's disease or cardiovascular disease or cancer and so on. And yes, these therapies are going to eat up some of that money, but only a small proportion. So from the point of view of any developed nation, it's going to be economically suicidal not 
to give your populace the therapies free at the point of delivery. In modern society, we tend to see older people as being frail and needy. In fact, the opposite is the case. Only 15% require regular medical attention. The remaining 85% are perfectly healthy and living life to the full. Of course, things like pensions and health care will be difficult to deal with, but let's think differently about them. Let's convert what is perceived to be today's burden into tomorrow's bounty. What is most interesting is that the majority of older people are economically independent. Essentially, as we move into the future, we're going to have a very large new player on the field, and it will be the player which is the people of age and all of the things that they bring with them. We've become accustomed to providing for the needs of youth, and as we move out into the future, we're going to have the needs of youth, the needs of people who are in their child-rearing years, and in the future, a very articulate, wealthy, and probably demanding people of age group who are going to be a very interesting other part of the mix. One of the under-recognised features of an older population is the purchasing power of the older consumer. They account for 75% of, of wealth in the EU, 80% in the UK and the US. What's really interesting about what we call the silver economy is going to be the demand for new products. Essentially, if you do nothing, that means huge costs in healthcare and huge pension costs, and younger people are going to be taxed out of existence. But you can turn that around and say that that's an opportunity. Most people now innovate products and services for 30 and under. You know, if they turn to the 50 plus market, they could innovate all kinds of products and services for those people. Older people want a whole different set of products. They want a whole different set of services. They want a whole different kinds of leisure and travel, etc. There is a huge opportunity here in Ireland to make this, uh, as it were, our niche capability. Increasing lifespans have become a feature of nearly every country around the world. And the market for goods and services targeted at the elderly will become a really important feature of the global economy in the next few decades. Ireland is already at the forefront and with more impetus could be well placed to benefit economically. If we focus on developing medical expertise, gene therapies and new technologies, Ireland can become a leading player in what is set to become the great gold rush of the 21st century. So there are many pharmaceutical companies who are very interested in this kind of, um, of approach. If you're the person who discovers the, the, these biochemical pathways uh, and you find the drug that, that blocks them, then yeah, that might be the, the elixir of youth and clearly there's a lot of money to be made now. The end of ageing is possibly the most radical change that human civilization has undergone for millennia. Dealing with it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Of course there are great challenges ahead, but we can overcome them. In many ways, we have no choice but to, because the generation who are growing old today are like nothing that has come before them. People try to put us down. The people who are now entering their 70s are the very same people who sang by heart the lyrics of my generation. Fifty years ago, Townsend asked his elders, Why don't you all fade away? And we all know what he really meant. Well, Pete is now in his 60s, and like the rest of us, I doubt he has any intention of vanishing. Far from it. Fifty years on, older people are coming into their own. I'm just talking about my generation. As Nelson Mandela said, the problem in life is not lack of power. The problem in life is not using the power we have. And older people simply don't realise the power that they have collectively to, to make things happen, to make this the kind of society that they want to make it. When thousands of older people came together outside Dáil Éireann in October 2008 to protest against the withdrawal of the medical card, we saw a glimpse of that power. The image of older people as kindly grannies and doddery granddads misses the truth completely. 
the generation who created youth culture, fought the cultural and the women's revolution, will fight the battle against ageism and be in no doubt they will succeed. At present, society may see ageing in a negative way. This is a total misapprehension because ageing is a wonderful achievement for mankind. Most people now are able to live their full lifespan and they're being encouraged to do it in a fulfilled and enriching way. Whether it's seen as a positive or a negative for society as a whole depends on our attitude. There's a huge potential for older people to contribute to society, but it, it requires the imagination to grasp that fact and to, to encourage it. Everything as we know it is changing. The human race will never be the same again. It is time for us to welcome and to enjoy the potential for living longer.